Hi Tara, good evening. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Yes, you're audible, ma'am. You're audible, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, ma'am. And near the ladies' hostel. Good evening. Da Deepu, good evening. <laughs> good evening, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, good evening. A very good evening to one and all present here. On behalf of Kairali Society of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists, I am extremely honored to welcome you all to today's webinar on setting an oral pathology, private practice, opportunities and challenges. In fact, very relevant topic in the present scenario, as the new graduates in our specialty find it difficult to establish themselves in academic arena, setting up an exclusive oral pathology lab can indeed be a promising venture. Today, we have with us a specialist in this field who not only envisioned the possibility of creating one, but turned that vision into a reality. I welcome Dr. Deepu George Matthew, Professor and Head of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology and Microbiology, Anur Dental College, Muatibuda. Thank you, ma'am. Sir, sir is also a founder partner and supervising oral pathologist of Nirnaya Orofacial Diagnostics, which is an exclusive oral pathology diagnostic center since 2016. Sir has numerous funded research projects under his guidance and has various international and national publications to his credit. Sir has also delivered numerous guest lectures on various international and national platforms. He has been awarded for best photography in oral and maxillofacial pathology by IAOMP 2008. He was also an advisor for the project proposal which secured SA Voxman Prize from ASPIC Clubs, a student engagement initiator for Asia Pacific for undergraduate proposals on antibiotic res resistance. Sir has also guided the project which secured second prize Young Scientist Award conducted by Chennai Medical College Hospital and Research Center, SRM Group. I welcome you, sir, to the webinar. The moderators for today's webinar, Dr. Maji Jose, Professor, Department of Oral Pathology, Enapoya Dental College, Bangalore. I welcome you, ma'am, to moderate the session. And Dr. Nivedita Baiju, Professor and Head, Department of Oral Pathology, Indira Gandhi Institute of Dental Sciences. I welcome you, ma'am, to chair the session. Over to you, Deepu, sir. I'll do the screen sharing now, no? Yes, sir. Uh, has it come to full screen now? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction, uh, Dr. Tara. And uh, I'd like to thank, uh, at this uh, moment, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Su uh, Dr. Sun uh, Sunil, sir, uh, President of uh, KSOMB and uh, Honorable uh, Secretary, uh, Dr. Mahija, uh, for giving me this opportunity and encouraging me to share my uh, experiences here. So uh, the topic I feel uh, that we have today, that is uh, oral pathology in private practice, opportunities, opportunities and challenges is very relevant as Dr. Tara has mentioned. So I felt like uh, it is important for me to uh, share my experience, like what has happened for me for the past uh, seven years, like where I have uh, just tried out how this private practice in oral pathology is going to work out. So I just like to share that experience with you guys. So. Um, so this is where I come from. This is where I work, Anu Dental College and Hospital. Uh, it's in uh, Muachibuda, near to Cochin, in the central part of Kerala. And uh, this is where we work. Like, this is where our department is. And this is when, like, and after the rains, like, uh, how the college looks like. Now, what is really happening to our speciality? We can see that, like, from 1995 onwards, like, if you look up to 2018, you can see that like up to 2000, there was no um, many number of dental colleges. And suddenly there was a sudden spike in the number of dental colleges. But when you see here until 2010, there is actually a, a deficiency of 
or a pathologist like and uh, these colleges were running around to see like if anybody is available for academic jobs and that was one of the golden times for uh, or pathology uh, where in which like people were just minting money like you know uh, they were getting huge salaries uh, like getting these academic jobs in these colleges and suddenly everybody felt like okay like and if you start an MD is in our pathology like um, uh, like all these postgraduates are going to come and they're going to make money and so all the dental colleges started to have um or pathology uh, postgraduate programs and then there was a steady rise in the people like or, or postgraduates in our pathology were coming out so in the end what happened is like after um, 2015 or something uh, the number of colleges uh, started to uh, like no no more new colleges are going are, are coming after that the De dental council put a cap over the number of new dental colleges that has been allotted so uh, the there was been a plateau over there you can see after 2050 from 2010 onwards there has been a plateau and you can see that uh, no more new dental colleges are coming but the number of postgraduates who are coming out uh, or pathology postgraduates who are coming out are steadily increasing so in the scenario what is going to happen when you see about the supply and demand you have more number of our pathology postgraduates who are passing out and less number of academic jobs that is available so this is the scenario you can see the dental colleges like around 174 dental colleges are there while the uh, number of oral pathology postgraduates output per year is around 559 and wherever you're going to accommodate all these oral pathology postgraduates who are going to come out it's not possible to have these uh, new graduates who are coming out to be employed in an academic jobs in a dental college so so now what is happening the scenario the current scenario that what's happening is like nobody is willing to join for a postgraduate program in or pathology because like everybody feels like there is not much uh, opportunities available uh, after finishing a postgraduation or pathology because uh, from the undergraduate level like the kind of perception that people have got about or pathology is that uh, it is a non clinical branch which i very much disagree about, disagree with so i think even a lot of publications also started to come about uh, <laughs> Uh, describing about like the fate of our pathology as a speciality uh, and uh, they have put like uh, great headings like is it a sinking ship or like people are talk started to talk about alternate um, uh, career uh, paths uh, like after finishing the post graduation in our pathology so uh, even in 2016 um, like during those periods like you know this kind of a doom was there like uh, when you talk uh, to any postgraduates uh, uh, in oral pathology speciality. So I, I, I remember still like in 2015 and 14 and all when I call my postgraduates for uh, seeing the slides and all, they will start complaining or they will start saying, sir, what is the use of seeing the slides? Anyway, we are not going to have a job in uh, this particular speciality. So uh, there, there is an overall gloom in uh, uh, about um, or a kind of depressing kind of uh, view about like our speciality. So that has been the predominant uh, feel about our speciality. Even now, like I think many people, majority of the people like um, hold on to this kind of a view. Now, what we need to understand is every problem is an opportunity for a creative solution. So whenever you uh, hit a roadblock, there is always going to be an opportunity waiting for you on the, on the sides. So that is something that you have to keep it in your mind. So Whenever you are in a problem, always you have to think out of the box and you may get, you will get a lot of ideas where you'll be able to uh, like overcome these kind of challenges that you're going to face on the way. So when a young or pathologist don't get academic jobs, the first thing they're going to think about is, okay, why don't I go for a general practice? Now there is one issue, like maybe like for three years, there have been, they have been uh, trained in or pathology and um, like uh, they may not have that kind of a clinical skill. For three years, they may be out of that uh, clinic. The clinical touch would have gone, and that becomes a big disadvantage for them. Now, imagine that if you're planning to do go for a general practice, you're going to set up a clinic. What are you going to do next? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to go and uh, you're going to start working um, as an assistant, uh, as an assistant along with uh, a flourishing pl practitioner, so that you will know the tricks and uh, or the tips of uh, how to manage a practice, a general practice. So you have a precedence, like, and when, when you, and, or you can go to a senior, like who has already have a good practice and ask, uh, ask advice from him. And from his experience, he will be able to guide you regarding like how to set up a general practice. Now, when it comes to, if, if you're planning to have an oropathology practice, if you are looking for a precedence, there is no precedence available. You look around, like you don't see anybody who has done this kind of a practice. So that was a scenario like, you now when I was like, when I heard all these kind of complaints from my, um, Graduates. So if you look around, like you don't see anybody practicing or pathology. 
so there is no uh, so the reason why most of the people don't go for uh, practicing or pathology is there is no precedence there is no um, uh, um, there is no uh, way for like for them to follow or there is no guidelines for them to follow so there is no business model available for an or pathology practice that is one of the biggest disadvantages why people are not practicing or pathology one of the disadvantages so in order to uh, overcome this issue uh, like that is why we started with the uh, uh, the concept of uh, starting in our pathology practice now you have to understand that whenever we start with a business like you have to understand this is not an academic talk this is more of a business talk and um, when we uh, plan to start with any kind of uh, a venture like you have to understand where you are coming from and uh, which place you are setting up the practice and for me like we are coming from i am from kerala and uh, i am residing here and the speciality of kerala it is like it has got a high uh, human development index that means that literacy rate is very high life expectancy is very high so people are very literate and uh, uh, they have high expectations about their health care now if you look about the per perceptions of the patients coming to a dental clinic uh, especially in kerala you can see that most of the people who come to the dental clinic are people with a higher and middle socioeconomic state that means that what all are the characteristic features of these people who are coming uh, to a dental clinic in kerala they uh, have less time like people who are on the higher social their time is very precious and uh, they need the privacy they need quality management they are not worried about cost if you bring down the cost they have a feeling like uh, especially in i feel like in the anagala area like and if you try to bring down the cost they have a feeling like they're getting a substandard uh, kind of uh, treatment so they're not going to bargain much on the cost and they are highly stressed people like maybe they are office going people and they have a lot of stress in their life so very high incidence of lichen planus in these patients now most of them have got a lot of information and there's an information overload coming for them from uh, like uh, internet and like whatsapp media and all those kind of things social media so most of them have got this cancer phobia so and they don't want to go to dental colleges because they don't want to spend time over there they don't want the students to see them like they want their privacy the time is very precious for them so they don't want to go to dental colleges so these are the kind of people who end up in the dental clinics usually now what about the problems faced by the dental surgeons especially when they are uh, sending a biopsy or they are trying to do an oral mucosa trying to uh, manage a oral mucosa lesion one is uh, like frequently i have heard like from surgeons and like other practicing uh, clinicians that uh, the quality of the reports that they get from a general pathologist uh, are not that great and because they are not able to uh, that the whatever the diagnosis comes from those reports they are not able to correlate that with the clinical findings because the general pathologists don't have any idea how the clinical uh, scenario is and they are not able they don't give the diagnosis based on the correlation with the clinical findings so the uh, the clinician who gets the reports are not able to make treatment decisions based on these reports that the general pathology labs are giving out so that is one uh, problem faced by the dental surgeons because i have frequently uh, talked with um, many um, maxillofacial surgeons and they have expressed this particular concern about it another reason is uh, they don't have the opportunity to interact with the pathologist that is another bigger uh, big issue that is having over there like because they want they may want to discuss the cases with the pathologist and they want to get an input about it and how to go about with it and what all are the precautions that they have to take how many uh, how long they have to follow up the patients all those kind of things they want to interact with the pathologist but that opportunity is not there especially in the uh, uh, corporate setup labs uh, because like uh, the <clears throat> the owners are not uh, pathologists pathologists are employed over there and they don't want a direct interaction between the clinician and the pathologist because after some time the pathologists have got enough contacts with the clinicians like you know he may start a lab of his own so they don't want that to happen so they don't uh, encourage uh, direct interaction between the clinician and the pathologist and next is uh, where to send these specimens like for them the convenient thing is we sending it to a general pathology lab because like they have a lot of collection centers and all those kind of things are there but uh, sending these uh, cases to a um, dental college like it's very uh, difficult for them so they take the easy way out so these are the problems that is faced by the dental surgeons so what we have here is we have patients like who are dissatisfied who has a lot of problems we have dissatisfied dental surgeons and then when you have these kind of complaints and when you have a problems like there is an opportunity always there if you can solve these problems like you have an op business opportunity or a venture opportunity is open up in, opening up for you so there is an opportunity there so you can see that in one hand you have an or pathologist who are jobless like you know who are skilled and uh, they don't have enough avenues for 
uh, utilizing their skills. On the other side, you have a dissatisfied patients. You have dissatisfied uh, dental surgeons who are not happy with whatever reports they are getting from a general pathologist. And if you can bring these two people together, you can bring these two people together, you have an opportunity there for a new venture. So that is where we started, like me, along with me, uh, Dr. Jubin, like who is now the professor and head of um, uh, Malabar Dental College and Dr. Karish, uh, who is an oral medicine person. Now he's in Bahrain. So three of us thought about like we were all working together in one college at that time. So we all uh, grouped together and we thought like, why don't we start a venture like this? And we thought like each of us will uh, invest, like put one lakh uh, into the thing and we will start with three lakhs as a seed uh, money. Like we will start a new venture. So that is how uh, we came up with an idea of starting um, uh, a practice, uh, especially in a, we have we will have an exclusive oral pathology lab along with that, like we will club the oral medicine people also so that like, you know, they will be able to give uh, uh, what do you call consultations to the dental clinic. So that is how we started with this Nirnaya orofacial diagnostics and treatment. <clears throat> so whenever you're starting with a business uh, or, a, or a new uh, venture, you have to understand who is your potential customer. One of the biggest problems that often uh, an oropathologist face is they always feel like uh, they are going to, uh, the, their potential customer or a client is the patients. But what we have to understand is um, it is not the patients who are our clients as a pathologist. It is actually the dissatisfied dental surgeons who are our clients. Because the patient comes to the dental surgeon, he takes the biopsies and the biopsies comes to us. So basically what we have to understand is for a pathologist, uh, it is the client is actually the dental surgeon or the clinician rather than the patient. We may not have to always interact directly with the patient, but we have to interact all the time with the dental surgeon. That is why I think uh, there was uh, a, a novel called um, uh, Final Diagnosis by Henry Denker, in which he has uh, it's a story about two pathologists and he mentions uh, a pathologist as a doctor's doctor. That is why, uh, like, because for us, like the clients are... Uh, the other clinicians or the doctors, not really the patients. So the vision for our um, um, uh, lab was affordable quality uh, oral health care for all. And the mission is empowering the clinician with diagnostic and treatment services and innovations for affordable quality oral health care. Now, the reason why I told you, like, why we have to understand the potential customer is in the end, we are all uh, a part of a team who's take, go, who is going to provide uh, quality care for the patient. But in the end, you have to understand that our role as a pathologist is to empower the clinician to give a better service to the patient. So uh, we have to keep, if you want your business to succeed, you have to uh, keep the clinician happy and give him the enough information or like uh, 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 support him in such a manner that he will be able to do uh, uh, quality treatment or give quality care for his uh, patients. So... Uh, Let's talk about the past, present, and future of uh, our lab and how it was going on. So along with that, you'll get all the tips of what all things we experienced. And like, you know, even when you are putting up a practice like this, we are planning to set up a practice like this. What are the challenges and the opportunities that you're going to uh, encounter? So the first two years, like uh, we were like, it took around two years for us to make an economically sustainable business model to develop a business model because we didn't have a precedence before. We didn't have anybody to follow. And uh, so we had to do a lot of things by trial and error and some things failed. And then we had to improvise and we had to start with the new ones. So it took around uh, one to two years for us to uh, like uh, bring up a business model. And once it became uh, break even and when we were able to sustain ourselves, then it took around five years for us to have a pan Kerala presence, like so that we will have cases coming from all over the Kerala. That is the present uh, scenario that we have now. And in future, we are planning to uh, uh, venture out into molecular diagnostics and uh, radio diagnostics. So if you look uh, at Kerala here, so when we started, we started uh, in, a, in and around that Ernagulam district in the small place we started. So I'm going to tell you, like share my experience about like uh, initially in 2016. When we started like how we started this lab and like what were the steps that we took in order to start this lab so this is a small area in which like we thought like we are going to initially uh, start our project with and so this part is actually a semi-urban area with five major towns and two local idea branches are there around 200 dentists were there in this particular locality and around 150 clinics were there so what we planned was like and around five dental colleges are there that is the important thing and with histopathology services and active general labs with histopathology services were also there. So 
we initially thought like what is going to be who is going to be our competitor so there is like one or two corporate general labs are there like with wide network all over the state uh, for them the tissue pick and the, to pick up the tissues and the cases and all are not not at all a difficulty and uh, they have large labs so with them we have to compete so uh, we need to have a strategy in order to uh, manage this competition so that is where how are we going to compete with them so that we need to have a strategy in order to uh, manage uh, this competition with these big corporate labs but for them like uh, oral maxillofacial lesions are a small tiny bit in their like huge chunk of cases that is coming to them and we also decided that we are not going into um, uh, hematology because hematology is more of an automated kind of uh, oh. way in which the uh, automated way in which the results are coming so um, if i go into that like i have to invest a lot and uh, it's very difficult to compete with uh, the the corporate lab so i thought like we thought like we will concentrate only on histopathology and cytopathology of oral lesions so we'll consider that as a niche market and uh, we also thought like uh, we will arrange consultants for diagnosis biopsy and management because that is one of the areas where the clinicians are finding it difficult to manage the cases and we also thought that we will do an on call tissue pickup from clinic so if the clinic calls us like we will arrange for a tissue pickup so initially we thought that but uh, in course of time we found that that is a big difficulty that logistic part is the most difficult part in the whole uh, scenario it's not about diagnosing cases it's about like every time a clinician calls like from somewhere to pick up the cases uh, which are what like something that we had promised and uh, it's not easy to uh, get people over there and get the tissues and uh, cases from there and the charges that you have to give for the people like who are picking up the cases like with that the profit margin comes down so that was one of the difficulties like that we had faced in the initial uh, period now the other uh, important things that we promised to uh, we thought like we can promise is the report is reporting is going to be done by an oropathologist and definitely we are going to have a personal interaction between the oropathologist and the clinicians so that kind of a personal interaction we thought is going to have a lot of leverage when it comes to um, uh, like uh, when we when it comes to patient uh, when it comes to giving satisfactory um, output for the um, the clinicians so this is how the, our report looks like and along with that we also give uh, photomicrographs also so initially when we started i didn't buy any um, uh, ips cameras or like you know digital cameras or anything i used my uh, cell phone itself to click photographs i cropped it and i put all this i marked the parts and all and i gave it off and i don't expect that we don't expect that the uh, clinician is going to understand whatever is being given in the histopathology but at least he will feel like for the same amount of money he is getting something more so that gives like uh, more of uh, a happiness for him uh, when he gets a report so the pricing what we did was we put the same price as that of the other established labs so one mistake when uh, very often like will happen when you start with the practice is people think that if you reduce the charges like um, the clinicians are more inclined to uh, give you cases but that's the, that is not going to that is not true because if you try to reduce the charges uh, what the customer or the client feels is like you have a substandard service so that is the reason why you are reducing the charges so you can um, put the same charge as that of the established other established labs but what we can do is that for the same charge give more value added services so that way they will have a inclination to give the cases to you so this is the way in which you have to initially attract the cases to you because like you may not, you may be unknown to those people those clinicians may not even know about you so this is the way in which you have can approach them say that i have all these things uh, services available for you so you give me one case and let's see like you know how it goes so that is how they are also going to think let let me give one simple case to him uh, to that particular lab and see how their output is going to come how their results are going to come if i am happy with the services i will continue with that so more value added for services that we give in, in for the same price is we give photomicrographs along with that and calling each doctor and discussing the case before delivering the report this is something that i have seen with my uh, sir like uh, ranganan sir Every, before giving um, a uh, report to uh, give, giving the report like he will call the clinician he will talk and he will discuss the case and so they have so they will have a lot of doubts and uh, um, apprehensions about this particular case they may have a lot of doubts to be clarified so they can they will have an opportunity to discuss that case with you you become a part of that um, uh, what do you call uh, the patient care team so that is very important and the tissue pickup so that was uh, one of the services that we Uh, had initially offered now 
So with all this kind of background, like we thought about, like we started with establishing the oropathology lab. Now, what you need to understand is like to establish a histopathology lab is not very expensive. You have to spend only 150,000 or something like that. So when you are planning a clinic, like which is going to cost around 10 lakhs or like 15 lakhs, uh, spending a 150,000 uh, is not a big thing. Uh, and so oropathology lab or a histopathology lab is not a very expensive, expensive thing. I'll, I'll explain to you like how the breakup of the expense is going to come. And the recur recurring expenses has to be kept at a minimal rate. So I'll tell you like how we managed to keep the recurring expenses uh, or monthly expenses to around 10,000 or 15,000 per month. So in 2016, when we started with, um, uh, when we established the lab, so you, you know what are the basic things that you need in a histopathology lab? You need a wax bath or an incubator. You can get that for a 15,000. Your local uh, made um, um, uh, wax bath or incubators and all uh, with incubators also, you can melt the wax. So that will come around only for 15,000. You can get a reasonably good one. Uh, we have in Perimbaur here and all like uh, Kemi, one company is there. They are giving these things. And since local companies are there, like any repair comes, you can take it over there and immediately they will do the repair and you can bring it back to your lab. Then uh, slide warming table, another 15,000. Tissue flotation bath, another 15 to 14,000. A microtome. This is where like, don't uh, think about investing too much on a microtome because you can get a microtome for around like 4 lakhs or 3 lakhs and all. But I have seen uh, when I was being there in other colleges and all, when I was work, when I had worked as a senior lecturer in many colleges, I have seen like people using the old Westworks micro microtomes, uh, which is a very uh, sturdy one and uh, a cheap one. And uh, it will cost only around 60,000 rupees. And you can put a, a blade adapter and you can put a Leica blade onto that and you can get reasonably good sections. So initially, when you're starting the lab, don't invest uh, too much onto the microtomes and all. Don't put like three lakhs and two lakhs microtomes. You don't have to buy that. Uh, we have uh, used this Westbox microtome pretty uh, efficiently for past three, four years. And after that, only I have bought a new microtome now. So initially, when I bought that microtome, it's around 60,000. I think now we can get it for around 80,000 now. 2016, I got it for 60,000. It's a Westbox microtome. And it will give you reasonably good sections. And uh, like you're not going to get like everyday lymphomas or things like that, sarcomas and all. So for peripecky granuloma cyst and all those kind of things, this will easily work. You can make the diagnosis with that. And the microscope, you can get a reasonably good microscope from uh, Lawrence and Mayo or Labomed for around 20,000 or something. The consumables, you need alcohol, uh, isopropyl alcohol, some silane, you need paraffin wax, you need uh, hematoxin and eosin. Maximum special stains you need is PA staining you need, uh, Van Giesen you need, Musicamine you need. So for all these kind of things, and you need some jars, like if you're doing a manual processing, with 20,000 bucks, you can manage the consumables. Furniture and all I got from my home and I put it over there. And we uh, uh, made, made the lab because we didn't have any walk-in patients coming over there. So there is no point in putting a lab in a town area. If you go into a city or a town area and if you try to rent a place, the rent is going to be very high. So this place like uh, uh, where we have rented was around um, 170 uh, square feet uh, space or 150 square feet space. And the rent was only 1,200 and the deposit was only 5,000. So it was in a panjayat area. So the paperwork also, all these kind of legal paperwork that you have to do is also much more easier. It can be easily done with a panchayat rather than a municipality or a corporation. So the, uh, what do you call the ward member and all will be very close to you. So they, you don't even have to go to the panchayat to get the things done. You tell them like they will go and do everything and give it back to you because the next time they want, they want your vote like, because like from your, the same place. So the total uh, uh, establishment expense came around only for like around uh, 1 lakh 50,000. And what about the recurring expenses that happens every time? So the lab technician salary was 5,000. You're thinking like how I got a lab technician, a histopathology technician for 5,000. If you um, employ a histopathology technician straight away, uh, the cost is going to be, the, they will charge that their salary will be somewhere around 10,000 to 15,000. So instead of that, I got a DMLT technician, an ordinary te a diploma technician, and I trained that particular person uh, in histopathology techniques. So that way, uh, like, you know, she was ready to work for uh, 5,000 rupees as the basic salary. Then what I told her that what I was doing uh, with them was, uh, I told them that for every case, I will give 100 rupees incentive. So that way, if the number of cases increases, 
their salary also increases. When my number of cases goes down, their salary also goes down. But whatever may be the uh, number of cases, she will get 5,000 5, rupees and then extra benefits will be coming as the number of cases are increasing. So that way they were happy. So when the cases increases, she will be also happy along with me because uh, she is also going to, going to get paid at a higher rate. Next is the electricity charges were around 1,000 rupees per month. And the medical waste disposal by image was around 1,500 per month. And the rent was only 1,200 per month. And other expenses, which includes consumables, like, like to the maximum, it can come around 5,000. So maximum, my uh, total expenses for a month for running a lab is around 15,500. And if I'm able to get around 20 cases per month, it will become break even. So I was initially charging around 650 rupees and later I started charging around 850 rupees. Out of this 100 rupees will go to the technician, rest 750 rupees will be there with me. So once these things were being established, like we started to, we wanted to canvas the dental surgeons. So until then I was working in a dental college, so I don't, I didn't have much contact with the dental surgeon. So we made like along with my partners, we started to go and uh, have a personal visit to the dental clinics. Uh, along with brochures and all, and we will uh, try to convince them to tell them that we are starting a new venture like this. And uh, we will try to convince them to give cases for us. And sometimes you can, uh, you, you should know that like when you go for these things, uh, like they may keep you waiting in your waiting room, even though they don't have any patients also, they may keep you waiting in your in their waiting room for around half an hour and all. So you should not feel any ego or anything like that. You should understand that you're going to, you're trying to establish a business there. And uh, whoever is sitting inside is your client. And you have to win that client uh, for your business. So you should not have any of those kind of, you should be very humble when you go for all these kind of uh, personal visits for dental clinics. Next is like another uh, group of people who are going to really contribute to your business is going to be oral surgeons and periodontists. So we also made personal visits to oral surgeons and periodontists. Most of them will be uh, uh, working as consultants in these clinics. And we also contacted the local IDA branches. And then we made a brochure like this, a nice brochure. And uh, we planned and uh, we had a kit like this with the brochure. We had a formalin bottle and it's all branded with our um, logos and with uh, biopsy bottles. And we gave this kit to each clinic. Then we invited them for launch uh, with, uh, and we had an, uh, we had associated with the local idea branch and we said that we're going, we will conduct a CD programs and we had to sponsor it completely because we were in the starting phase and um, so we started with the launch and it was going to be inaugurated by not an oropathologist, but a maxillofacial surgeon. Because you should understand that we are trying to run a business here and our major clients are going to be surgeons. So it was inaugurated by Dr. Varghese Manisa, uh, who is one of the pioneering surgeons, uh, maxillofacial surgeons in Kerala. So once uh, Varghese Manisa uh, inaugurates uh, or launch this particular uh, lab, uh, all the surgeons is going to notice like, oh, okay, the Varghese Manisa is attending uh, one function, he's doing something. So immediately their attention will be captured by this. And so that is how we, uh, we have to uh, bring the attention of the dental surgeons and the maxillofacial surgeons to our practice. And this is where, like, you can see all our partners, the IDA members of Malanad IDA and uh, Varghese Manisar, like, you know, after the inauguration okay. and the launching of this Nirnaya or Official Diagnostics. And along with that, we also conducted a CD program where we try to convince or show them the cases where in which the histopathologic diagnosis actually made a lot of difference in the way the patients are being managed. So with that, we be able to, we thought we'd be able to convince the uh, dental surgeons to do more biopsies and give more cases. So this is how we started with the labs. And let, let me now uh, share with you the experience that uh, we had over the past seven years. So the formula for, uh, the, there is a formula called H is equal to E by R. That is, happiness is equal to expectations divided by reality. So these are all our expect. These were all our expectations. That these were all the things that we were expecting to happen. But in the end, like uh, you can't expect all these things to uh, become successful. Some failures will be there. Some things will become successful. But whenever failures are there, uh, you should not get disheartened. You have to improvise and you have to find a new solution for it. So uh, when we if you try to analyze like who all are giving cases to us, you can see that 51% of the cases were uh, given by oral surgeons for us. And the rest, 23% was by oral medicine consultants. And uh, around 15% were by uh, general dentist and 11% by periodontist. So these were the group of 
uh, if you break up uh, the clients like who are giving cases to us this is how it appears so how we how it the really cases come to us you can see that the dental clinics or the general practitioner give, can give directly cases to us or sometimes it is the uh, the oral surgeons uh, or the periodontists they go to a dental clinic then and they get the surgeons get the cases they give the cases to us and when the report comes i will give the cases back or the report back to the uh, surgeon and also i will get an opportunity to interact with the dental clinic so this way from the references uh, given by the oral surgeons i will be able to get more and more dental clinics i will be able to interact with more general dental surgeons and that way more and more people will start coming and giving cases to us so the challenges what we faced was it was actually an emerging market even the dental surgeons were not much aware about oral mucosal lesions or they were not taking much biopsies so we had to cre initially create an awareness and create a market for ourselves there was no existing market we had to create a market and we have to get uh, the business going and the next one was really the general practitioner themselves so let's talk about uh, general practitioners when it comes to oral mucosal lesions what are the perceptions of a general practitioner you should understand that because they are going to be one of your major clients one is they have a big difficulty in making diagnosis they are not at all proficient most of them have got a lot of difficulty in making diagnosis and they are very uncomfortable in taking biopsies and uh, uh, for them it's very difficult for them to convince the patient for doing a biopsy because every time they have a feeling like if i tell them that they have to take a biopsy the patient will become very apprehensive very tense and become a, going to be a big problem for them and the another major issue was the time versus money the kind of, the amount of time they are going to spend with the patient like if they spend uh, on a patient for an rct or doing an implant they are going to make like triple or quadruple times money than managing your oral mucosal lesion so most of them they don't want to uh, manage oral mucosal lesions so they just ignore like these mucosal lesions so they consider it as a headache so that is a common perception of a, a general practitioner that i have seen so you may think that when you're starting a practice if you go to a busy and established dental practitioner who's having a lot of ops every day you're going to get more biopsies but that is something uh, that i have seen that is not right because these people they have already established a practice and um, like they're not going to change the way they are going to practice they are going to follow the same set and they're uh, same way they are they are comfortable and they're not going to change the way they're going to practice so uh, you can go to them but don't expect uh, if they're not already taking biopsies don't expect they're going to start taking any more new biopsies now you have to look at the young dental surgeons who are starting with the practice for them each patient is important each procedure is important so a person who is starting with the practice if you approach that particular uh, dental surgeon you have a better chance of getting biopsies from them so they may start like uh, experimenting with biopsies they may start trying out biopsies and you may get a lot of cases and you establish a relationship with them you are going to get a lot of cases out from them and the other group that you have to really focus on is dental surgeons who have surgical skills like oral surgeons and periodontists and some general practitioners who are extremely good in uh, like uh, surgic surgeries and they will take a lot of biopsies like they don't have to be even oral surgeons now how to reach the potential customer that was the next question like because like going to each uh, clinic was not very um, practical because there is a limitation like you know a lot of time is going to be wasted so we felt like one of the uh, uh, one of the ways in which we can approach them was by advertisement but we understood that this advertisement is not really going to work because the relationship between a clinician and a pathologist is a lot of trust is involved in there the reputation of the clinician is going to be uh, uh, very much dependent on the reports that is given by the pathologist because he is going to make his treatment decisions based on the reports given by the pathologist so just by looking at an advertisement nobody is going to give you cases but instead of that if you conduct training programs and you will have a opportunity to directly interact with the directly interact with the clinician and that is an opportunity where you can we, we can actually um, uh, convince them to give cases for you so cd programs on the importance of biopsy procedures in dental clinics so those kind of training programs if you can conduct that is going to be really beneficial so here so the kind of points that we actually put in the brochure is adding value to your practice because for a general practitioner the practice is everything so you say that you're going to add more value to their practice 
and you say that you're going to give a hands-on training and punch biopsy on animal tissues. So these were like some of the, um, uh, along with ideas we have conducted. So after the first thing, we have done, uh, like nobody has charged anything from us. Like we have gone there, we have given it free of cost, but uh, they have arranged everything. Idea people have arranged everything for us. So we have done many um, uh, IDA uh, uh, training programs for the, general, uh, for the dental surgeons like this. So, so many, every three months, we'll be conducting one program in various IDA branches. So when we go for uh, this uh, CD programs, we don't uh, give lectures like okay, red and white lesions. If you start giving lectures like that, nobody will sit and listen to your lecture. So what we have to do there, all these practitioners, they are, all, they are interested in listening to your experiences regarding managing of cases. So I'm just going to tell, show you one of the cases that we, like many cases we'll discuss. This is the one of the cases, like this is, these are the kind of cases that we discuss in these kind of training programs. It's uh, a 39 year old female patient who had a history of extraction on a partially impacted uh, three, eight, 10 months back. So an erythematous growth uh, has occurred on the site of where the previous uh, extraction has happened. So you can see here, there was an extraction. This is an extraction area where 10 months back an impaction was done or an extraction was done. And in that area, after 10 months, a, 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 a sessile swelling has or a growth has come over there. And um, uh, when an OPG was taken, you can see that that particular area has where the teeth was taken out, that bond loss is only there. Otherwise, nothing much. And the tissue was taken and uh, histopathology was done. It was nothing other than a follicular amyloblastoma. So here, when we discuss this particular case, this particular case was kept for a particular reason because you can see that if somebody has taken an, done an extraction in the area where the extraction has come, done, 10 months back, the patient is coming back to the same clinic saying that there is a growth coming from there. So this gives a message. The message that we're going to give along with that is submit the tissues that you get during extraction that is a periapical or follicular tissues for histopathological examination. So after listening to this particular case, the, the general clinic practitioner will think, okay, like what if like if I'm extracting and I get at some tissue and what if it is some kind of a pathology and if I miss that and later something grows out from that socket, I'm going to be in big trouble. If that kind of a message gets into his head, definitely whenever he does, does an extraction or does an impaction, whatever tissue he gets, he's definitely going to send it for a histopathological examination. That itself is enough for making your practice a successful one. And you have to specially mention about the um, liabilities, like the criminal liabilities or the uh, legal liabilities that can happen, uh, the litigations that can happen along with that. If you don't give the tissues for histopathological examination, you miss a case. And later, the, what if the patient sues you? If you put that message also along with that, all these people are going to send the cases to you. So these are the uh, training sessions that we do. Like we get around 40, uh, not like how when we do rotary endodontics and all implantology and all, we'll get around 30 to 40 uh, doctors will come usually for these kind of training sessions We when we organize it with an IDA. And uh, we have these kind of uh, banners being put over there. And uh, we use animal tissues, um, uh, gore tissues and all fire. They can do or practice punch biopsies. So that is going to be an added benefit for them. So they will get trained or they will have a feel of how this punch biopsies really uh, work. And we give them complementary kits. So we give them these kits like uh, free of cost because we know that once you give this kit, they will have like next time when a patient comes, they will be inclined to do a biopsy. And we also give them a punch also free along with that. This punch, when you buy it in bulk, it will come very cheap. And you give this punch to them, like this punch will go and th they will take a biopsy from their biopsy with this punch and the a case will come back to you. So that is, uh, the, 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 that is an opportunity for you to get introduced to that particular doctor. And from there onwards, like your relationship starts. So that first contact, you have to do these kind of things in order to get that first contact with the uh, dental surgeon. And they, will, they should feel like, okay, let me send one case to that particular lab. And let me see how it works out. So in 2019, when the COVID started, like when we used to have a lot of webinars like this. So online programs, you will get a lot of participants. Right? Offline programs, you get less participants. But in offline programs, you have better possibility for direct interaction. And when you do hands-on and all, like you have a lot of opportunities to interact with them. So that is going to be a big advantage because the potential users of your service after a CD program, what I have seen is, 
if you are looking at a cd online cd program only one to two percentage of those people are going to use your services or they're going to come and give the cases to you while in offline cd programs around 10 percentage of these people are going to start giving cases to you if you conduct an, a cd program in an ida where around 50 participants are there at least five or six of them are going to start giving you cases so one of the the successful things that we have seen is about conducting these kind of cd programs and you just say that you're going to give a hands-on course on hands-on whenever you they hear hands-on for a cheap rate immediately they will all all the dental surgeons will come and join for it you say they are going to be hands-on for uh, punch biopsies uh, they will easily um, come for the cd programs now another challenge that we faced was logistics like because we had initially promised that we're going to give an on-call tissue pick and uh, then we started to get uh, calls from um, like you know calls for cases from all over the kerala then we found it really difficult to arrange this tissue picking uh, picking the tissues from or cases from different areas one approach what we did was like um, uh, some of these uh, dental lab people they already have people going around in uh, ernakulam city and all picking uh, their cases so along with that like uh, we have made an arrangement with them so that they can also collect cases even now we are uh, doing that for the, our old customers but the new clients and all we are now insisting that we are made uh, boxes for them to send it as a courier nowadays we are uh, using this courier so uh, we have now limited the direct picks and where reliable sources are present we are there only we are uh, limited and uh, we have started courier packs for uh, tissue transport so this uh, actually this uh, usage of couriers actually helped us to get a pan kerala presence because nowadays we are getting cases from palakkad from trivandrum so from all those places much more easier uh, and uh, much more convenient for us to get these cases through couriers and we don't have to um, give any charges at the the whoever is sending only will bear the charges i am not we are not bearing any of those charges but if i am allow, asking somebody to go and pick the tissues or cases from the clinics i have to give some um uh, some kind of uh, charge uh, have to give some kind of a charge to that person who is picking up so that is going to reduce the prof profit margin for me so initially this is the uh, kind of kit that we used to give but instead of that now what we are giving is we have made courier packs where already addresses are there then inside that uh, we have um, boxes uh, in inside the box we have um uh, white mouth bottles and which has been put in another casing so that like during the transportation it will not get spoiled it will not get destroyed and along with that we give formalins uh, in uh, branded bottles also now one of the important things uh, especially when it comes to doing setting up on your own practices knowing what you don't know is very important is very very important especially when you are managing the cases by yourself you have to understand what you can't manage and then you have to get help from others so you have to have a group of people who are going to support you you need to maintain a, uh, maintain a relationship with them so that whenever you have a difficult case there should be enough uh, support base for you where you can get uh, uh, what do you call feedback from now one advantage for uh, pathology practice is unlike a surgeon who has to make a decision then and there for us like it takes like around like you can take a time of a period of around one week time for you to get uh, to give before you give the diagnosis so this one week time you can actually go around and you can if you want if you have a difficult case you can get opinion from senior people and uh, get this get case sorted out so it's very important that you need to have a good relationship with the general pathologist who has who's attached to a lab which has got an ihc setup so that uh, you can if you want to do an immunohistochemistry on your case like you have to um, have a lab access with and a general pathologist who is willing to discuss the case with you and where you can get an inputs from that person and you can also have um, a, a contact with the experienced or pathol senior or pathologist uh, who can also give feedback for your cases and your own um, professor will be the best person who already you know very much very well and you need to have um, uh, a contact with the dermatologist and a physician because there are going to be so many scenarios there where in which you have to clinically correlate and you may need uh, an expert opinion from these specialists also so now what we have is like uh, we have uh, cases coming from all over kerala and we have like uh, people who are regularly sending cases uh, like you know from these uh, wherever the flags are there and wherever the triangles are those are the places from where like, we get regularly cases some people like they send three or two or three cases in every month 
So that way, like uh, we get regular cases nowadays. So nowadays, like we, we are now after this uh, two to three years, we have a pan Kerala presence throughout the Kerala. Uh, people are sending cases to us. So how many cases we are being getting like till now is uh, the next question. So we can see that this is how uh, for the past seven years, like it's a six months break. Uh, break uh, I have shown like how these number of cases have come. So you can see that here, this is where we started. Initially, when we started, like we used to get around 10 cases in a month. That's all we used to have. So in a year or a one and a half year period, like you know, we were able to increase the number of cases to around 20. That is when we became break even. So by around 2016 means by around 2018, we had around 20 number. The, the number of cases that we used to get was around 20. So as soon as it became break even, we had another problem that happened. That was in 2018. You know that like there was um, a devastating uh, flood in Kerala. So that is when like the number of cases dipped down. Then again, the cases, number of cases increased after that. Then came the 2019 and 2020 Jan, that period to, uh, to the 2020 period where we had the COVID lockdowns, where all the clinics were shut down and we had a severe uh, reduction in the number of cases. Still, we were able to, uh, whatever cases were coming, we were able to process it and we were able to give the reports. And now, like, we are get, getting around cases of around, like, 35 to 40 cases in a month. And uh, we are able to uh, get a, amount, a, a profit margin out of it, around 10 to 20,000 rupees we are able to get uh, per month. And so what are the uh, advantages that we had? The advantage is, like, uh, we had a beginner's advantage. There was nobody else doing this kind of a practice. So it was easy. We didn't have to compete with any other or pathologist for this private practice. So this and another one was like low investment. We didn't invest much. We actually, when we started, like what we uh, talked among ourselves, like me, Jubin, and uh, myself, Jubin, and uh, Dr. Karish was, if you go for a conference, uh, uh, the cost is around 10,000, uh, cost is around 1 lakh, like all the train, like you no know, uh, flight fares and uh, the registration charges and all will come around uh, 50 to 70,000. It will come. So we let let us uh, spend one lakh and don't go for a conference for one year. So we will be able to compensate that and let us invest in uh, this practice and let's see how it uh, works out. And if it fails, like you know, there is only one lakh we are going to lose. Each of us are going to lose only one lakh. We will just uh, consider this as a kind of risk that we are going to take. So the low risk only was there with, because we had only low investment. And uh, we were able to establish, uh, since we were uh, the only people who are uh, there, like, you know, running this kind of a practice, we were able to establish a network and a brand value and gain the trust of the clinicians. We just had to get one case out from one clinician and uh, the how you communicate matters a lot. And because of that, like, you gain the trust, you get the friendship. I um, we have we have a lot of these con uh, contacts with all these surgeons. Like I've never met them. I have only talked with them in the phone. But the, the, a lot of friendship you can create, and a lot of um, uh, like contacts you can create being a pathologist. Now the disadvantages that I have faced with this kind of a practice setup is it takes time to establish this practice because you have to gain trust. And so it takes time to establish this kind of a practice. So growth is very slow, and it is an emerging market. You have to train people. They have to convince people to do biopsies. So it's an emerging market and it has got a slow growth, but a slow and steady growth. But the growth will be sustained. It will not go down because these people, once they are in your influence, or once they are convinced that you're good, they keep, they'll keep giving cases to you. They will never give cases to anybody else. So the future, we are planning to uh, increase the number of cases, build up the number of cases. And we want to build an online community where, like, we can have regular interactions. We can send, like, sh uh, short videos on, like, how to manage each, each kind of case or how to diagnose a white lesion and things like that, where we can have case discussions. And uh, you can use the same setup or the same histopathology setup, and you can do con contract research. Uh, people who are doing PhDs, who are doing dissertations, they want your IHCs to be done. The same setup can be used. IHC is nothing much, than, nothing big. It is just putting those uh, antibodies on the top of the slides, nothing else other than that. So the same setup can be even used for contract research. I'm doing that easily. You can make a good amount of money. I see it enough is, is enough. And sometimes they like, you know, some people who are doing um, uh, animal research and all, they may want to process their tissues and uh, get some kind of an interpretation out of it. So I said, like, uh, I'm an oropathologist. I don't know how to 
check the liver and all. They said like, uh, or what the report that we are getting is not from a general pathologist. I'm getting it from a technician. So you'll be better than that. So then I bought one atlas and uh, saw how these, um, what do you call GI, GI tract uh, histology and all is there. And I used to give, that's risk free. Like uh, you don't, they're not going to, uh, no treatment is going to be based on these things. So you have to give uh, like reports. You can give reports like that. So that is for animal research and things like that. So you can actually venture into contract research if you have a lab setup like this. And radio diagnostics with the CBCTs and all those kind of, if Dr. Karish comes back from, he's now in uh, Middle East, comes back, he's an oral medicine person. If he comes back, there will be an opportunity for us to start with the radio diagnostics. And uh, we are also planning um, in course of time to start with a specialty oral mucosal uh, disease clinic. We have two, three oral medicine consultants along with that, along with us and uh, who who can actually uh, who can be utilized for uh, this particular uh, specialty clinic so this is how we started with it now as we, we as i was uh, we, we were experiencing all these challenges uh, in this practice i felt like there is other opportunities also available other business alternatives are also possible because uh, i had a dent uh, i had a job in a dental college so i had a regular income coming and this was only a side income that was coming along with that so if somebody wants to start a clinic or somebody wants to start a lab and that is the only income that is going to happen because the growth is a pretty slow one. So you may not be able to make a livelihood out of an exclusive oropathology lab by itself. So an alternate business possibilities are there. So one of the things that I felt like is going to be very much feasible is having a dental clinic along with that, having an oropathology lab and having a consultation. So if you're planning to set up a dental clinic, you're going to, you may have around 10 lakh 10 lakhs or something along uh, in your hand in order to set up a dental clinic. So if you can set up a small oropathology lab also along with that, that is going to be an added contribution to your dental clinic. And you can have, just like how an orthodontist goes and does consultations, you can go and have consultations in other dental clinics for oral mucosal lesions. You can take biopsies from there and bring it to your lab, process it and give the reports to those clinics. And you can use your dental clinic as a oral mucosal specialty clinic also. And the technician who is there in your oropath lab, if they don't have enough cases in the pathology lab, you can utilize the same person as your receptionist or uh, your dental assistant. So that way, like uh, the salary that you're going to give for the technician is not going to be uh, wasted. So I feel like this is one of the areas where uh, the future uh, uh, oropathologists have got a lot of possibilities. You can you do your specialty practice at the same time you can uh, gain uh, the initial incomes from your dental clinic in your general practice also. So combining general practice with an oropathology lab is going to be, I think, an excellent opportunity that people has to uh, look into. Because like setting up an oropathology lab is going to cost you only 1,50,000. Less than 2 lakhs, so easily you can start an initial lab setup. So another uh, alternate business possibility is having a basic hematology lab with that of an oropathology lab. You know that hematology labs are going to be uh, like if you want to get the automated machines and all those kind of things is going to be expensive. But now some of these labs, the corporate labs that have come, who are running it, they are not uh, anything. They are just ordinary people. I have seen one uh, BS graduate who is actually run one of these labs, and they do only they function only as a collection center. The only equipment that they have got over there is a centrifuge machine. And they collect the blood, they centrifuge it, they separate the serum and all those kind of things. Immediately, uh, the courier, age, courier people will come or the uh, collection agent will come. They will take the uh, specimens to Ernagulum. Within three, four hours, they will get the reports. So the only equipment that they have to get over there is the centrifuge machine. And they need to have that space, that uh, room space also has to be there. It has to be furnished. So this kind of a basic hematology lab, you don't have any risk of giving any report. You don't have any headaches of uh, like uh, uh, conducting the, um, um, uh, interpreting the results or conducting the test. You just have to be a collection, collecting, a, collecting area and or a collection uh, area. From there, like the cases will go and immediately the results will come. Because it's all like hematology is basically an automated process where the input of the pathologist is not going to come much. So if you can, th this is one way you can establish a basic hematology lab with minimal investment without even purchasing um, uh, an analyzer. And along with that, you can have an oropath lab also. So this is another business possibility. And the third one is like becoming a consultant in diagnostic labs. 
Now, this is where like if you go, become an, when you are an oropathologist and you go to a big diagnostic lab and you say that I'm an oropathologist, I want a job there. Nobody is going to give you a job because uh, what the owner of the lab is going to think is the general pathology. I'm already employing a general pathologist and the number of oropathology cases which are coming over there are very less. And even if it comes, the general pathologist is able to give some kind of a report for that. With that, like somehow I'll be able to manage. Why should I pay this person? uh separately and and why i should have this unnecessary uh expense going to come to me that is how the owner is going to think so if you want to become a consultant how you should approach is you need to have enough contacts with the surgeons and you should go to a lab and say that i have many surgeons uh who are uh, whom i have in contact with and they have want to give cases to me and they want my reporting so i want uh, uh i i want a facility where i can um process the tissues so can you give me the facility in your diagnostic lab and uh, can i report uh, from your lab so i don't want a uh, salary or anything uh whatever cases comes uh like you can take the charges for processing and i will take the rest of it and i will do the reporting so that way you automatically becomes a consultant in that those diagnostic labs and without spending any money on establishing the lab you become a part of a large diagnostic setup and you will have your own cases with you so uh, there is one person who has done the same uh, that is doctor uh, this like he is a part of uh, this big um, lab that is in trishu that is called the sudarma metropolis lab and that is doctor uh, anthony george he is the professor and head in mes dental college oral path department and uh, before he come came for uh, oral path thing uh, oral path he was the assistant for i think dr vargis manisa so he already have had a lot of contacts with uh, maxillofacial surgeons so nowadays i don't get any cases from trishu because uh, uh and nichatna is already doing a lot of practice over there and they already are very happy with his reporting um but i think that is one way in which like without spending any money you can actually uh, start having your own practice and uh, this is another example it's about our srinivasan savron srinivasan sir like uh, he is having a roaring practice and along with that he has now started a small practice like weekly once uh, just like a physician he will be sitting with a chair and a table uh and uh, he gets a uh, um, patients with oral mucosal diseases and he treats them so he has put this uh, board and saying that why le charma roga vinakthan or the specialist for skin of the oral cavity by seeing this uh, board itself like you know uh, people who without any other advertisement people have started coming to him and i think he gets around uh, one or two two to two to three cases in a week he has this consultation this particular case once in a week so uh, the time is gone when uh, a pathologist used to be a faceless person behind a report like and nobody knows who it is now if you want to thrive uh, or you, if you want to have a good uh, practice in our pathology you need to have or in a pathology practice you need to have great communication skills so what you need to remember is that if you are a postgraduate student in pathology this is a time when you want to uh, uh, what do you call uh, have when you have to have contacts now this is the time then you have to have friendships built uh, with the periodontists oral medicine people oral surgeons and all the other brand specialty because you have to understand they are all your potential clients later initially when you uh, initially uh, the initial phases when you are uh, finished your oral path post graduation when you are coming out these friends that you have made in your dental college should be the first people who are ready who should be ready to give the cases to you so you should when you are post graduation don't fight with your, any of your colleagues in the other departments so that is something that you have to keep it in your mind now when it comes to the post graduate training i will say that it is very important that our post graduate training or pathology training has to become more clinically oriented where in which the uh, the pathologists the oropath post graduates who are coming out should be able to do clinical diagnosis of oral lesions they should be trained to take biopsies and they should have an exposure in the medical management of oral lesions and they should have an even an exposure to den general dental practice during their during their post graduate training so that as soon as they come out from their um, post graduate training they should be uh, you should have a still have that touch in the general dental practice and they should be able to set up their own clinical practice and in that way i am very happy to say that my management is uh, very much uh, uh, supportive of us and our uh, post graduates are getting trained in impactions like implantology rcts and even uh, they are taking biopsies in the second years and the first year they are doing all these things so the take home message is uh, we need to have an economically uh, we have are able to establish an economically viable business model 
uh, in our pathology practice. So that means that like, you know, if you start with an our pathology, pathology practice, it's not going to get doomed or anything. You're going to get cases. There are few challenges there, but we, we, we should be able to address those things and we should be able to go forward. And the role of an oropathologist, and if you want to become really a successful pathologist, is to support and empower the clinicians, a clinician, and become a team player in the patient management. And when you try new things, like things are going to get changed, like the, sometimes things, uh, there, there can be, um, uh, what do you call, failures can happen. But instead of getting disheartened, you have to keep improvising and you have to find solutions and you have to learn from your failures. So we have to say that oropathology definitely as a specialty, we face challenges. And you can actually consider that as a big problem or you can con convert that ch those challenges into opportunities. It's up to you to decide what to do about it. So if you just imagine like, you know, we, the, the postgraduates, expert, what, what, what do you expect? Uh, like you do you expect that as soon as you finish your oral path post graduation people are going to come and ask uh, whether can you come and please join your college or like you know can you come and do this job nobody is going to come and offer you any kind of job you do you imagine that the other specialty people like uh, in conservative or live in in ortho and all nowadays ortho uh, there are a lot like all these ortho, uh, clinics have got orthodontics it's all saturated the initially the uh, the people who are coming out from or orthodontics post graduation they have to go to each and every cleaning they will ask for a consultation like you know as a position as a consultant and it takes around three to four five years for them to establish themselves as a successful consultant so the struggle is not only for our pathologists for every specialty the struggle is there and we should not expect that the people are going to solve the problems for us we have to find our own solutions so if you want to become successful it all depends upon your attitude and your uh, how much you'll be able to improvise uh, based on the experiences that you gain. So I'd like to thank my teachers like Saraswati Madam and Rangadhan sir for like making me what I am because the skills uh, that I have learned from them is what uh, uh, what I'm able to do now. So I am really, I have to place my gratitude uh, for them, I have to, show, uh, to express my gratitude for them. And I'd like so, also like to thank my department, uh, my postgraduates and my uh, colleagues uh, for supporting me all the way around and in the end the most important thing is like you should have the god's grace always prayer should be there each case you handle uh, mistakes can happen at any time and uh, the right thoughts has to come in the right moment so that um, uh, you should always be humble and uh, uh, that uh, that god's grace has to be always there with you to make uh, a successful practice so thank you so much for your patient listening that's all Thank you, sir. Now I call upon Dr. Maji ma'am and Nivedita ma'am for your valuable inputs. I'll just uh, stop my screen sharing. One minute. Yeah. Good evening, all of you. I'm very happy to be a part of uh, KSO in the program once again. So thanks to Makija and team for giving me this opportunity. And uh, Deepu, hats off to you. It was an excellent presentation. And only you can do this. I would definitely thank, thank say. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much, yeah, madam. Because you have, you know, like, as you've been so generous. I have to acknowledge that. And I don't think anybody will be so open-minded, you know, like uh, explaining each and every aspects of, you know, how to set up a, uh, like a lab where you yourself, you have mentioned that you never had any model in front of you. And everything is, you know, like a from scratch, you made it. And then you were so generous that, you know, like you have explained everything, everything to people. So, you know, like it is, it's so easy uh, for somebody else to take up this in future. And you have uh, covered, you know, like how you have developed the business model and have to make it uh, economically viable. And also, like, you know, that uh, how you have empowered the clinician so that, you know, like you ensured that the uh, flow of uh, clinical materials to your, uh, you know, like uh, lab and, you know, like everything. It was really, really informative. And uh, the challenges you have faced, everything. So, you know, really it was a great, uh, like, uh, session uh, Deepu and uh, Deepu before I open that discussion to other people let me ask you one question uh, one yes. thing that do you follow any quality control system or 
quality check for your uh, biopsy reports uh, ma'am uh, what i have done is like especially for the laboratory techniques we have by experience we have seen like uh, we have calculated like how many blocks like uh, or how many blocks we made by the time the um, um, uh, what do you call the uh, chemicals will get exhausted so all those kind of checks and balances have been uh, like uh, have been uh, for, uh, like have been made ready so that we know that around 50 blocks if i process my alcohol and the cyanine will get exhausted and after that i will start getting problems during processing so we have made all those things sure and so that we keep changing the uh, fluids and all those things in the right moment so we have already standardized on those things and uh, we are uh, doing those uh, quality controls uh, like uh, frequently madam <laughs> this uh, biopsy reporting any uh, you know like uh, see uh, like uh, nabl uh, do we have to go through any of this inspection process or anything like that ma'am ma uh, at, at present we don't have to do any of those things like uh, if you have an nabl um, accreditation it is going to add more value to uh, your practice but uh, for that uh, the number of cases has to still go higher so we are we are waiting to a period where in which like we'll have more number of cases now we have around 40 cases but if you go to a general pathology lab they get around uh, 100 cases in a day so that oh, is a kind okay. of uh, volume that they get in a general pathology mm -hmm. so with an exclusive or pathology still the number of cases has to go higher then in future we are planning to do that but for uh, giving legally we don't have any issues in giving a, a report even with an without an nabl uh, accreditation so uh, it should not be a problem uh, for at, at the time being but i think um, in course of time the clinical establishment act is going to come and with that some kind of an inspections are going to happen but at present what we have is like when we are setting up a lab uh, from pollution control and all those from the panchayat and all those places for people will come for inspections they will come and uh, have a check on the things and all so those kind of inspections will happen but with clinical establishment act being uh, set up i think we are going to have inspections in future so we have now uh, moved from uh, 170 square feet space to around 800 square feet space. Now, even if an inspection okay. comes, we'll be able to manage it. <laughs> and okay. we keep all the records uh, ready and we have okay. uh, all the uh, biopsy registers. We have biopsy registers. We have the soft copies of the reports. We keep all the blocks, even though we have mentioned that six months later we will you know, uh, uh, remove the blocks and all we have mentioned. But still, I keep all the blocks uh, like, you know, till now, all the blocks are there with me. So even if after one year also a patient comes and they want to have a block back, I can still give the blocks and slides to them. So all those things are we have uh, kept in the proper way. Mm -hmm. Good. That is what was supposed to be my next question. Anyway, you have answered it along with that. You know how you maintain the record. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Deepu. I'm not taking much time. Anyway, congratulations to you, you as well as your team, Jubin and Karish. Definitely, it was a good uh, initiative, and uh, may God bless you with uh, you know like uh, okay. more success in your uh, business model, because you know like uh, that is Deepu's touch. You like you know at the end of uh, you have also told something about the human relationship and also God's grace. Definitely, may you know you have all this God's grace so that your business model let it flourish and hope that it uh, would have uh, you know like. Uh, um, at least, um, you know, enlighten some of our budding oral pathologists, like, you know, so that they won't get discouraged or they won't, then, you know, like uh, feel bad that they have taken oral pathology because they have to take the profession forward because all of us are now almost uh, like, you know, particularly myself, we are thinking of retirement. So the youngsters should take the lead now. So definitely your presentation would have, uh, you know, encouraged them to take challenges and go forward. Thank you, madam. Yeah. Thank, so you, thank you. So over to Nivedita. Madam, please unmute, madam. No. Yeah, ma'am, we can hear, ma'am. No, we can't hear, ma'am. Now, can you hear me, Dr. Dilbu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, okay, yes, ma'am. Um, I think, first of all, thanks to Dr. Uh, Sunil and Dr. Mahija for the choice of topic and the speaker as well. And uh, 
I must say, I think Dr. Deep was somebody I think whom I, I have personally known him very closely right from the days of his student days to what he is. And I've seen the growth and hats off to you, Dr. Deepu. And uh, like Dr. Maji said, I don't think anybody else could have done that, Dr. Deepu. I think Thank as you. a person, uh, your uh, this thing on uh, humanity, everything, genuinity, I think to come here on such a dais to share it, your every experience right from the scratch to where you are. I'm sure I think you want to get a lot of phone calls after today's topic, Dr. <laughs> Deepu. Everybody will be having some of the other queries, I think, Dr. Deepu. And Thank I think uh, this was exactly what our speciality needed. I think we all need to be keeping our positivity high with very much high this thing. I don't think anybody can do anything to our speciality. And uh, like I always say, you know, like any specialty for that matter, I think you take a six months course in RCT, implant, ortho and all, and you can start with it. But I don't think oral pathology can, we can <laughs> never do such a thing of, you know, taking some three or six months course. So nobody will dare to come and look into the microscope other than our specialty. So I think that is a point that, you know, nobody can take what we have and we will always remain. And I think it's just a small transient period. We'll get back, I think, with time with the, uh, Surely in a very good way, I think. Okay, I think let me not take much time. I think uh, there are some queries in the chat box, actually, Dr. Deepu, for you. Yeah, ma'am. Um, let me check. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Nirima has asked, do you need to do any special stain any time, Dr. Deepu? Definitely, we have to do special stains. Like the common special stain, we need to have only two to three special stains that's routinely to be needed. Uh, one is okay. PAS. Every time you need to have it. Because like if you are okay. looking for a candle infection, um, uh, you have to have a PAS. And um, you need to have some mucicamine also. Because once in a while, you may get a mucopidemoid carcinoma and you need to check whether it's a mucin or not. So PAS and the music come in together like it's going to really work for you. And uh, you can have Van Giesen also. So with Van Giesen is a very simple uh, trichome staining. So very easily you can do that. And if you want, like once in a while, have a Congoret. So with these uh, special stains, you can easily manage. Um, but IHCs, I really, really don't uh, go for IHCs because like once in a month only you may get uh, uh, a spindle cell neoplasm or a clear cell neoplasm or a round cell tumor. And uh, getting all the panel of markers and buying it and keeping it like within a year time, it is going to get expired. So better than that, I go to a uh, general pathology and where a good uh, general pathologist is there, I get their feedback also. And they will do the, uh, what do you call, uh, IHC panel uh, testing also will be done by them. So that way, uh, I don't have to spend money on IHCs. So I can just, uh, I will tell the clinician that um, I'm going to, I can do the IHC. This much is the cost for the panel. And in Karita, I usually get it done in Karita's uh, hospital because it's an oncology center also. And Dr. Bindu over there is a very good pathologist and uh, she is very magnanimous and she uh, interacts with you. She discusses the case with you. So you also uh, have this also a learning process along with that. As you see more and more cases, like you learn a lot of things along with that. So that is how I go about with it. Okay. Then, uh, sir, what are the legal aspects in establishing OP lab? Like, do we need to register it like a company or what are we supposed to do? Uh, you can, uh, you don't have to register it as a company or anything. You can have it as, just like how you run a dental clinic, you can run your oral pathology lab. And uh, it, and if you are in a panchayat or in a municipality, you may have to register it in that municipality or panchayat as a diagnostic lab. Uh, they may not even know what is the difference between a hematology lab and a um, pathology lab you just have to say it's a diagnostic lab they'll be happy with it and they will come they are mainly concerned about pollution and all and uh, once you have the pollution certificate and you have the health inspector coming and checking about all the things it should be fine but once the clinical establishment act if it is um, going to get done you may have some kind of an inspection coming from uh, pathology people like or uh, doctors and all but otherwise there is no other legal hassles in uh, running your own practice as long as you are registered with your dental counsel you are uh, qualified enough to practice your pathology, your profession. Okay. Does contacting corporate hospital help or they insist on giving the tissues to their own lab where diagnosis is done by general pathologist? No, I didn't get it, madam. Does contacting corporate hospital help 
or they insist on giving the tissues to their own lab where diagnosis is done by general pathologists contacting no, what usually uh, yeah, what, yeah, yeah yeah what usually happens is when you go to a hospital like uh, they may insist that the cases uh, or the uh, reporting has to be done in their own lab so that kind of a problem will be there so usually what happens is whenever those people when the maxillofacial surgeon in a corporate hospital is not happy with the general pathologist report he usually gives the case and uh, the blocks and slides to me for second opinion so if i am charging 850 rupees for um uh, for a general processing and uh, for uh, blocks and slides i just have to cut some sections so for that i will charge around uh, 400 or 500 rupees so it is much more uh, profitable for me if i get uh, more second opinions because i don't have to waste any of my uh, chemicals and uh, i can just take some sections and i can charge more for it so that way it would be much better okay what are all the licenses that we need to start an oral path lab uh, so i already told yeah. yeah i already told you this with the panchayat or the municipality or corporation wherever you are setting up the lab uh, you need to get the licenses from them otherwise like if you are, the only main thing is that you have to be a registered dental practitioner and you should have a post graduation in post graduation should also be registered so th those are the things that you have to keep it in your mind otherwise uh, uh, whichever local uh, body where you are setting up the lab that place like uh, you have to get the licenses from i feel like it is much more easier if you can get uh, your lab in a panchayat because it has got the least legal hassles when compared to that of a municipality or a corporation uh, because you know if you're getting your cases uh, by courier by the means of courier and all you don't have any you don't have to have any walk in patients so there is no need for uh, like uh, putting it in a town or a city or anything where the um, the rent is also going to be very high so you put it in a small area where, like away from the city it's, uh, the legal hassles are also going to be lesser the licenses like that you have to get is also going to be much more easier to procure and uh, the rent is also going to be lesser okay there are i think i think ihc i think you have already answered deepu and uh, yeah. another question do you use buffered formalin um you can actually use buffered for formalin but i don't usually i have not uh, till now i have not used buffered formalin but even with using the ordinary formalin i am able to get good results and even ihc i don't have any issues till now but ideally i feel like it is better to go for a buffered formalin because um, like uh, if you are planning to later do an IHC for uh, the tissues and all buffered formalin is going to give you better results without any hassle. So uh, in future, like in, we are planning to go for a buffered formalin. Okay. Another question is for tissue processing, you use acetone or alcohol? I use alcohol because acetone, like even though they give good results, like they are more harsher on the tissues. So, um, and uh, alcohol is much more cheaper and uh, it is much more milder on the tissue. So, I usually go for alcohol and acetone is more expensive. So okay. alcohol is much better. There's a question like, you know, if you start a hematology collection center, will it help monetary benefits, sending samples yeah. to pathology? Yeah, right? yeah. actually, like in a hematology, the profit margin is more than 50 percentage. You can't imagine like how much profit they are making. So if you make a, a collection center, you can mint money like anything. So and uh, you need to the main important thing about hematology lab is you need to have um, um two three general practitioners um i feel my what i mean is the medical practitioners who are willing to send cases to you who are having consultations nearby and you have to put it in the center of those places you may have to give incentives for them like or like you may have to give them some cake and gift and all you may have to send them and all and if they are willing to uh, refer the cases to you you can have a wonderful practice so it all depends upon your communication skills how much you are able to convince them to send the cases uh, to you okay disposable of disposal of chemicals like xylene and formalin uh, that is going to be a big issue the xylene and formalin uh, disposal is going to be a, a big issue so uh, till now i have uh, collected all the xylene till now and i have kept it <laughs> so it's not easy thing to do it um but we have image uh, uh, waste disposal is there by ima but they don't take silene so silene disposing silene is a big issue so now what i do is that i collect the silene and i keep it because i don't feel like you know just draining it away because it's a carcinogen and it is not right for me to do that so i'm just collected and and i've kept it like that and i think there's a thing uh, tobacco cessation clinic attached with oral pathology lab particularly opmd diagnosis your suggestions so, that is a great opportunity over there and uh, in the college we are now establishing 
uh, a, a, a tobacco cessation clinic and you can have this tobacco cessation clinics in your along with your oral mucosal lesion, lesion practice and uh, that is going to give you a great opportunity so now i'm attending some basic counseling course also so that i felt like you know if you need to have some kind of a uh, training in counseling and that's very important for you to uh, do the proper counseling for the tobacco cessation clinic and um, uh, nicotine replacement treatment easily we can give so there is no issue at all and i think uh, that is uh, there's a great opportunity over there where you can establish a practice in that particular way and you can even get consultations from other clinics also if somebody if you establish a practice like that people from the other uh, or the other dental practitioners they can refer the cases to you so that way you can establish a good practice in that particular way it may take some time but once it is established and if you are giving a good um, uh, service uh, it is going to uh, be there for a long time then uh, as oral pathologist can you run hematopathology lab as well now uh, according to the latest um, um, uh, this thing um, that uh, supreme court ruling and this thing like and for the dca and all what they have said is uh, you can uh, do the hematology if it has been uh, sent by a dental practitioner dentist, yes. so that is how it has been now but uh, if you look at to any of these labs that has been run uh, none of it has been run by a general pathologist. So in the end, uh, the reason for running the lab is, again, again uh, de definitely you're going to give a service to the patient, but it's for making the money. And none of these labs are owned by a general pathologist and all. It's ordinary people who are running these labs. If you want, you can employ. If you're getting good profit out of it, you can employ one MSC uh, biochemistry person over there. And uh, that is more than enough for uh, the as a uh, person to sign the reports. So if you want to make money, you can make money with that. You don't have to be a general pathologist to do all this stuff. There are two more questions, Dr. Deepu. Do you need to get permission for buying ethanol and uh, disposal of leftover fixed tissue? I think that's a good question. Leftover uh, fixed now, tissue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next uh, problem is like the kind of uh, tissues that we get. We get small incision biopsies only. We are not like uh, if it comes to a neck dissection or like uh, big specimens like that, it usually goes to a, a general uh, pathology lab. So we don't have those kind of problems of uh, tissue disposal. But again, the tissue disposal with image is possible. IMA is having this image and the image is uh, allowing tissue disposal and that uh, service is being provided by the image services. So that is not an issue. Uh, so tissue disposal is not an issue. The other one is about ethanol. We don't use ethanol at all. We are using okay. isopropyl alcohol. So that is not a problem for us. Buying the isopropyl alcohol is not an issue. So I think uh, that's the questions. And I think more of it is all uh, appreciating and congratulations for Dr. Deep only. So congratulations, Dr. Deepu. Thank and you, lots madam. and lots of luck. May you grow more and more, you know, so that all of us get all the old pathologists take home their positivity from you as well. Then Thank you all there. Yes. Thank you, madam. Yeah, thank you, Madam Ma'am and Devitita Ma'am. Now, on behalf of KSO MP, I request Deepu sir to accept the certificate of appreciation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I request uh, Maji ma'am and Nivedita ma'am to accept the certificate of appreciation as well. Thank you. So I request everyone to switch on their cameras for a photo session. Okay, thank you. That brings us to the end of today's session. Thank you, Debu sir, for that enlightening and wonderful session. And our sincere thanks to Maji ma'am and Nivedita ma'am for moderating the session.
thank you all for your active participation and looking forward to see you soon and i request you to kindly take a moment to fill the feedback form that has been provided to you in the chat box only those who fill out the feedback form will receive the certificate of attendance thank you good night thank you good night thank you thank you I'm good night all i'm mahija